When my husband asked me to speak on Mother's Day, I got a little nervous because I'm not a Sunday morning preacher. I'm a Monday through Friday teacher. I won't make you run the aisles or shout the heavens down, but hopefully today you will leave with your faith refreshed and deeper understanding of the truly wonderful God that each and every one of us strive to serve. And trust me, some days it's hard, isn't it? It's not every, it's not easy. He has given us a truly powerful word, and I am thoroughly convinced that every bit of the book of the word that he has given is ready because it's alive. It is waiting. And it is wanting to be the life changer in both your external circumstances and your internal inner stances. Mother's Day is such a special celebration. And as I began to go through the Rolodex, anybody remember what that is? (laughs) The Rolodex of biblical moms, so many had come to mind when I was thinking about this. We have Ruth, we have Mary and Elizabeth, we have Sarah, Hannah, and Jochebed, all these wonderful women in the Bible, and the list could go on. But out of all the mothers in the Bible, the one that I could not get my mind off was Hagar. Does anybody even know who she is? Hagar. We don't really think of her much And as a mother, she isn't on the top 10 list of the Bible Hall of Fame for mothers, but she is one of the most intriguing. What do we know about this woman, Hagar? Well, according to to some Jewish commentaries in the Midrash or the Chabad, it's called, Hagar was actually an Egyptian princess. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, after God had told Abraham to leave his country and people, he traveled through Egypt. And he knew what a hot babe he had at his wife. (laughs) He did. He knew it. And he knew the danger that he was in if they knew or anybody knew that he was the husband of this hot woman that he was married to. Is that okay to say? And so what had happened, because Abraham, again, was pretty wise, but he was fearful, and Sarah was apparently an extremely beautiful, she was like 70 years old at this point, and he asked her to lie and say she was his sister to anyone who asked. And when she did, Sarah's, and when she did that, Sarah's beauty, and they went through Egypt. Sarah's beauty caught the eye of Pharaoh, and she ended up in Pharaoh's house. As history is told, God brought plagues into Pharaoh's home while Sarah was there. And at this point, nothing was consummated, but God was going to make sure that nothing went down in that house. And so he began to plague that house. It doesn't say with what, but he did. And he, God must have spoken to Pharaoh because Pharaoh went to Abraham and he said, why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? And so we see here that Pharaoh just wanted him out at this point. But because of the power that God revealed in these plagues and speaking to Pharaoh, Hagar wanted to be a part of this God of Abraham and Sarah. Now, according to some of the commentaries, Pharaoh was the one who gifted Hagar his daughter. But other commentaries say it was Hagar. But either way, this princess allowed herself to be put into a place that was not in her comfort zone. It was said that it is better to be a slave in Sarah's house than a princess in my own. Are we feeling that today? We could have the world by whatever. We could have everything in that this world has to offer. But I would rather be, I don't remember who said in the Bible, I would rather be in the doorkeeper of the house of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Because there is nothing like the presence that we feel today. There is nothing like the presence of God. 
And so, you know, in time, in the time we live in, we are so spoiled. <laughs> Once a month for a week here in this church, we have a, a time of prayer and fasting. And I think about some of the sacrifices as I was preparing this message. I was thinking about some of the sacrifices um, that we hear from some of us um, as, as every week as we're trying to give honor um, to the Lord during this time. And truly, they are sacrifices. And it hurts. And some of us, it hurts us tremendously to go without some of these things, like coffee. <laughs> God knows that if I'm doing without coffee, time is serious and I'm going into some serious spiritual warfare. <laughs> right? And so some stay off social media. Some others stay off their phone or they give up sugars and sweets. And while I don't want to diminish any sacrifice because only you and God know, I'm pretty sure none of us sacrificed quite like this young lady did. So what did this young Egyptian princess exchange when she submitted herself to become the handmaid of Sarah? Because she did submit. How many of you have kicking and screaming kiddos who... They're screaming and putting their brakes on out the door, throwing themselves on the ground, and they are just not going to do what you want them to do. Well, they're not submitted. She could have done the same thing, so she made a choice to submit. So what'd she give up? Well, she probably had quite a few or a suite of attendants assigned to her at birth. And she probably was in a royal nursery decorated with color. She possibly could have lived in a harem with hundreds of ladies in waiting. I'm just going by what princesses back in that day had. She tracked um, or she traded the glitter of the lavish Egyptian courts she would have one day or presided over with its ceremonies and its banquets um, and religious rituals. She sac um, sacrificed attendance um, doing her hair and her makeup, picking out her outfits, adorning her with gold and jewelry. She left lavish banquets held in the palace with tables overflowing and buckling under the weight of meat, roasted fowl, loaves of bread, sweet cakes, fruit, wine, and beer. These are all the things that she sacrificed. Are you feeling a little guilty about your telephone, about your coffee? Come on. She left the comfortable, luxurious surroundings of formal rooms or courts used for ceremonies and matters of state and less formal king's houses where the royal family congregated to relax and spend time together. And for amusements, she may have even had musicians or acrobats. And she was more than likely had tutors and she was educated. She was raised up following her mother to all the religious rituals. She was a princess. And an Egyptian princess was um, very unlike a Hebrew woman. Hebrew women were not equal under the law, but in Egyptian, a princess was. She was equal with men. She was able to rule. She was able to inherit property from both of her parents, and she was able to dispose of her own property. Some even became rulers if an appropriate male ruler could not be found. So she could have had a future in the things of the world. And this, for a God, she gave all this up. And now she left all this for transient tent living. And instead of having ladies in waiting, she herself was waiting on a lady. She gave of herself for another person's interest and will, disregarding her own. She was now subject and under authority of a, superior, of a superior and had little or no standing. There was no leaving her position. Even if she wanted, there was no changing her mind. She was owned. How you feeling about your sacrifice this morning? And this for a God who in a moment of a time manifested great power that intrigued, 
awed and bewildered all those who experienced it. So while our sacrifices may be indeed sacrifices to us, none of us had exchanged our family, our future, our lives to the level of this young lady. And we were the ones who were bought with a price, amen? In 1 Corinthians 6, it states, for we are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. In Psalms 45, 10 through 17, it states, hearken, O daughter. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thy ear. I want you to listen, daughter. I want you to hear what I have to say, daughter. What I want you to do is um, I want you to forget thine own people in thy father's house. And so shall the king, who's our king? So shall thy king greatly desire thy beauty for he is the Lord. Worship him. If you just forget the past, our king, he is our God, our king, he's beckoning everyone, not just women, not just daughters. He's beckoning each and every single one of us, man, woman, child, elder. He's beckoning all of us who calls themselves his to break away from your old alliances, break away from your carnal thoughts, break away from your divided affections and your distractions because it is affecting your relationship with him. It is that blemish in your praise. It is that spot on your sacrifice. And God says, if we do conform to his will, then he will delight in you. What does that even mean? What does delight mean? To me, it's like a, 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 word that we really don't use much anymore. And so I try to find what, how does God delight in you? What does it look like when God delights in you? Because I know when Mary, when Mary was delighted in, when, when she was highly favored of God, what happened to her? She was delighted in, right? So, I mean, she was blessed. Don't get me wrong, but she had to go through a lot of stuff to be blessed. God, don't delight in me so much, right? <laughs> no, but really, what does it look like when God is delighted with you? There is this scripture in Ezekiel 16 and 8, and it says, now, just want you to put yourself in this position, I just want, to, this is you, that each and every one of us, I don't care what background you came from, I don't, I don't care what princess you were, or you thought you were, or what prince you were, or you thought you were, this was you and me and every single one of us before God came along. Ezekiel 16 and 8, now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, Thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee. What does that mean? He spread his skirt over thee. He began to protect you. He began to cover you. He began to, to draw you in underneath the shadow of his wings. And behold, the time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. When you are in sin, that nakedness is your shame. And so what he wants to do is he wants, he covered that nakedness. He covered your shame. And it says here, Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord. He's, a, he's in covenant with you. He's making an agreement with you. And it says here, um, saith the Lord, and thou becamest mine. I'm, I'm his. I want you to say I'm his. I'm in covenant. 
He washed me. He cleansed me. He covered my nakedness. He's protecting me. And here we go. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee. And I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen and I covered thee with silk. Now you're the true princess. Now you're the true prince. And this is not outward that he's talking about. This is what he's adorning you on the inside and the outside with. I clothed these again also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen. I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornament. And I put bracelets upon thy hand and a chain on thy thine head. I want you to know that the bracelets that they wore back then, they were bracelets of bondage. What they did is they took chains and they attached those chains to your arms, which bound you. That's where those bracelets came from. Amen. And so what he did is he took those items of bondage and he turned them into ornaments. What was once bound you now is nothing to you anymore. And I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thy ears and a beautiful crown upon thy head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. And thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil and thou wast exceedingly beautiful and thou didst prosper in my kingdom. You know what? At that time, you exchanged your handcuffs and your metal collars for bracelets and chains of gold by God. Your crown represents your now new place in royalty. You have been delivered, you have been loosed, and you have been freed. You are no longer bound. That is delight. So Hagar, wow. But it's Mother's Day, Sister Crow, so why are you talking about Hagar, right? I wonder if Hagar even thought about, at that, this point, motherhood. I wonder if she even thought what it would be like to be a mother. You know, I, I, I was thinking about when, when I was pregnant with my first daughter. And, you know, the first one is always, you know. I don't want to say the most special, but the pregnancy is the most special because you've never been through it before. And so you got to buy the best diapers, right? Got to buy, you know, that $80 pair of diapers, you know, because nothing else will do, right? The, the, you have your memory books and you make sure that every little movement and flutter you're, you're covering and, and, you know, you're writing it down. And when the baby comes, every moment is written down. And you've got all these dreams and you've got all these hopes and, and you think about all these things that you're going to do with this child, right? And that's what we do as mothers. But I wonder if Hagar even thought about that. And if she did, were her thoughts like, did you think of what um, it was like at home in Egypt? Maybe she had dreams of decorating a colorful nursery. Maybe the joy of swaddling a newborn. Maybe, maybe that's what she thought of. Maybe it was, you know, where she got to choose maybe a wet nurse because she, she's going by what she grew up with, right? That's all she could do. Maybe she, she, you know, thought about sleeping in while the wet nurse took care of all the midnight and early morning feedings, changing the diapers so she didn't have to. You know, maybe she thought about... Visions of the proud daddy gleaming over both baby and mama, showering them both with love and affection and joy. Or did she even dismiss the whole idea? Whatever, oh gosh, sorry about that. <laughs> Whatever she was or was not thinking, her life was getting ready to take a very different turn and one that I'm not sure, nor does it infer that she was ready for. In Genesis 16, 4 through 16, and you could follow along if you want, because we're going to be in these scriptures for a little bit. Um, now, Sarah, it said, now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. 
And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my handmaid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Now, this was the custom during that time, so it was not unordinary for this to happen. And so, in verse 4, it states, And he agreed, and he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And so, we see here that Hagar, after she found out that she was pregnant, she began to look down on Sarah. She began to elevate herself above her mistress, and she began to look down at her. According to the Midrash, Hagar Hagar not only began to treat Sarah disrespectfully because she was able to have a baby immediately, and Sarah, not at all after so long of being with Abraham, but began to run her down in front of all the other women. Here we have a slave who began to rise up. The princess in her began to rise up. Her old nature, her air of superior rose up. In 16.5, and it says, And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon me. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her what pleaseth you. He didn't want nothing to do with it. I did what you asked me to do. You, she's yours. You do with her what you want to do. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So Sarah just began to treat her bad. She treated her like a servant. She brought down that princess attitude very, very quickly in her. And oh, how often does it happen that we get caught up in ourselves? Our circumstance, we get caught up in ourselves, our circumstance, our stuff, and we begin to disrespect the call of God upon our lives. Our attitudes towards the things of God, the house of God, the men and the women of God begin to change and we compromise, replace his commitment and we disregard the calling of God upon our lives. And oh, the message we send to the very ones we were sent to mentor, to model and nurture in the things of the Lord. And always... If it hasn't happened already, it will. If you're in that position, you will find yourself out of position, out of his will, wandering, angry and weary with the very places and purpose God has prepared and planned for you to be. That's what happened with Hagar. That old person came rising up. We have to be careful. We have to remember who we are. It won't happen to you. I'm too grounded in God. It won't happen to you. It won't happen to me. Happened to Lucifer. His arrogance and pride got him kicked out of heaven because he forgot who he was. Hagar forgot who she was. It happened to Saul, who the Bible states was little in his own sight. He lost out of the kingdom being established because he forgot who he was. It happened to Jonah, the prophet of God, who allowed his personal feelings and opinions to get in the way, and he found himself in the belly of a whale. He forgot who he was. It can't happen to you. Are you stronger than Jonah? Are you stronger than Saul? Are you more angelic? than Lucifer was. Proverbs 4 and 20 says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. As my husband always says, check yourself before, he says it with an attitude, check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) And don't be fooled into thinking you must be in the will of God um, or that he is pleased with you when blessings appear during this time. And we do. A lot of us have an attitude, and we right away, we don't have 
we don't have just an automatic, you know, bad things don't start to happen. In fact, things start to go really good. And the Bible says that we need to be very careful. And so let's find out what happens to her. In 16 and 7, after she ran, it says, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. She found a fountain of water in the wilderness. A fountain of water in the wilderness. That just does not happen. And so shortly, (laughs) contextually, The majority of the time, any time there was a wilderness experience, it signified what is uninhabited and what is uncultivated. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. When you are in a wilderness, I don't care how much water is there. If you are in the wilderness, he is, it's an uninhabited place. He's not there with you. He's doing something. I shouldn't say he's not there with you, but he's doing something. Um, It also says wildernesses are symbols of waste places, wandering, spiritual dryness, and emptiness. Um, You see, we, we have a fountain here. She must be in the right. And so when the angel of the Lord came to her, he said to her, basically, you know, what are you doing here? But he not only said that, he looked at her in 16 and 8, and he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, he addressed her by her true position. The first thing the angel did again was remind her of who she was. He checked her at the door of pride. And then he said, but whence camest thou? Basically, Hagar, where are you coming from? You're running away from your commitment you've bound yourself to and your duty. Where are you coming from, Hagar? And then he proposes another rhetorical question. And whither wilt thou go? She was going back to Egypt. She was running back to her people, to their gods, and the dangers of journeying through the wilderness to get there. Hear me. When you forget who you are, you will always resort back to who you were. Always. Remember, therefore, it says in Revelation 2, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. And and Hagar turned around and she said, she responded to him, I flee from from, from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And in 16.9, it says, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, return. Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Can God call you out like that? Think about that. You're in a position of haughtiness where you elevated yourself. Can God call you out like that? Can he call you back to a position of humility and submission? And what's more, will you answer the call? Too many of us, we don't answer the call. Too many of us are too prideful. We don't want to submit. We don't want to do what God is calling us to do. And God is asking you today, will you answer the call? Are you willing to go back? Are you willing to resubmit yourself? Are you willing to live by who you really are? And so I thank God that he gives us pastors. I thank God that he gives us teachers. I thank God that he gives us elders. And we may not have angels of the Lord speaking to us, but we have all them that God has sent us. And in 1611, it says, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child and thou shalt bear a son and shalt call to his name Ishmael because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. God hears you. God knows. But sometimes in our affliction, sometimes in our affliction, 
we just, we, we're running the opposite way. But I want you to know that God hears it. He's paying very close attention to where you are at right now. He knows. And he is just saying, just go back. Just resubmit yourself. Go back. What a comfort it is. And at last we see here, and I'm just about done. At last we see here that Ishmael was born. Time has passed, quite a few years. Sarah still did not have her baby. I think they said it's about 14 years, 13 or 14 years difference. And Sarah's promise finally comes to fruition. He was, um, Ishmael was the son, however, that Abraham never had. And we see here that when Sarah even found out she was pregnant, imagine the celebrations that were happening. Imagine the excitement that was going on all the way up to the actual birth. And you can imagine how Hagar and her son began to diminish and to diminish and get smaller and smaller. Because all the excitement now is about Sarah and the birth of Isaac. The time comes Isaac is born, but we don't hear any more about Hagar and Ishmael until Genesis 21, when Isaac was weaned anywhere between three and five years. And apparently, Ishmael was not a really nice kid. Because it says that one day that Sarah watched Ishmael kind of abuse Isaac a little bit. And she went over to Abraham and demanded, get rid of this bondwoman. Get rid of this slave. And we see here in Genesis 21 and 14, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he took his bread and a bottle of water, and he gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed, and she wandered in the wilderness in Beersheba. She is back in the wilderness. But I want us to compare these wilderness experiences because there is very unusual differences here. The water was spent. When she was in the wilderness the last time, she had fountains, a fountain of water. And so you would think, you know, that she is out of the will of God, she's being punished. There could not have been anything further from the truth. And then she, what she did is she cast that child under one of the shrubs. The Bible says it was a bow shot away. So I'm thinking about somebody who's got a bow, and I know that a bow could probably go farther than the back of that wall. So that child was put under a shrub far away. Why? because she couldn't bear to see the promise die. She couldn't watch it anymore. She just figured this is it. So she sat there. She sat over, the Bible says that, that, that he's, just a, he's a good way off and, and probably just where she could barely hear his cry or not hear his cry at all, but, but that, but that, her son, that blessing, that, that, that promise was hidden. So she did not even want to pay attention to it. But the Bible says that she sat over against and she lifted up her voice and she wept. But the weird thing is, it says that, it, and it says, and God heard the voice of the lad. <laughs> Sarah's weeping and she's crying and she doesn't want to see her son dies. This is, this is what she had to hold on to. I mean, she was chosen for this. She didn't choose this. She was chosen for this. And there she is. And God heard his cry. What? I'm crying, God. I'm the one who's out here. Do, can, don't you hear me, Lord? You are the God who hears. You are the God who sees. 
And I want you all to think about what it is in your life. I want you to think about what it is your promise. I want you to think about what it is that your hope, that that hope and that promise and that thing that you have laid up and that you have put a bow shot away because you refuse to believe it anymore because it hurts too much. I don't want to hear my promise cry out to me. I don't want to hear that hope cry out to me. It's been too long. I prayed for it. I, I pursued it. And God, nothing has come of it. Put it far from me, Lord. But the promise was crying out. Your promise is crying out to you. And God hears you. He hears the promise. He is letting you know that it's still there. He's letting you know that it's still accessible. How do I know? Because God turned around to Sarah, um, to Hagar, and he said, I want you to go ahead, and I want you to put your hands on that boy. I want you to pick up that promise. It is yours. Pick it up. And God opened up her eyes, and she saw a well of water. God provides in your affliction. He provides in your wilderness. And sometimes your wilderness is the will of God. Let's worship him. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. A lot of times we think we're out of the will of God because we're doing without, because our lives don't look like we think they should. God, I've given my life over to you. God, I've sacrificed. I'm I'm, pay, I'm doing everything I know to do, God. And my life is just not looking like I thought it should. It's not what I envision, God. Everything is falling apart. This can't your will. But in the wilderness, when she had a fountain, she was out of the will of God. When she had nothing, when she was crying out to God and her promise was crying back out at her, she was in the will of God. Oh, Jesus, you were so good. So God, it says over here, It says here in verse 20, so God was with the lad and he grew. God just, he told her again, this is your, this is your, this is your son. I've already told you that he's going to be a mighty man. He's going to be a crazy man, but he's going to be a mighty man. And it says, and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Mama still had a big part to play. And that boy was 14 years old or 15 when he was in that wilderness. There are some of you here today who have made a commitment to live for God, or even maybe if you're a young person here today, that decision was already made for you by a parent. But life has not exactly been what you thought it would have been like. You're in a place where you have put that thing, whatever it is, away from you because you feel like it's dying and you just can't bear to walk with it anymore. For each of us, it's different. For Hagar, it was her son. For you, it could be your calling. It could be a child. It could be a career. It could be a healing. But Ishmael's life and purpose could have only been fulfilled by a mother who was obedient to the call. If she was not obedient, Ishmael would have never been. The promise and the destiny God had for Ishmael could only come to pass if there was a mama, if there was a mama who humbled herself, kept pressing through when it got unbearable, kept pressing through when 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 things just didn't seem like they were going to get any better. She just kept pressing through. She forsook her family and, and she forsook others, other friends, and she you know, forsook a pursuits that did not align with God's plan. She was obedient to the calling, and because of that, There's a great nation 
because of a mama who was obedient. Dad or mama, your kiddos need you. They are watching you. I don't care how old they are, whether they're 14, whether they're two, whether they're 16, whether they're 20, doesn't matter. Are you going to be the one who folds up like an accordion at every adversity? Are you? Dads, this is for you too. God is watching. Are you laying down the spiritual authority God has called you to be in your home for the distractions of this life? God is calling you. What is your position? Have you, dads, forgotten who you are? Have you placed your promise, your hope, the dream that was birthed in you and forsaken it? Today, I'm here to tell you that you have a God who sees. Everybody, please stand. You have a God who not only sees, but you have a God who hears. And if you just hold on just a little bit longer, Keep doing what you know to do. The God who sees and the God who hears will refresh you. He will refresh you with water. He will remind you by reiterating to you your promise. I want to tell you something that happened to me years ago, and I'm wrapping this up, but I was really going through a lot of things many years ago. And God, when in the beginning of this this huge trial that devastated my world and turned my world upside down, God gave me a scripture. It was in Isaiah, I believe, 54, 55. I can't believe I don't remember it anymore. But I read that whole scripture. And every time things got bad, I held on to that scripture, says. I held on. I said, God, this is my promise. This is what you gave me, God, and I'm holding on to it. And every single time that I, God, I can't, I, I, I don't think I could take another, another dip in the road. I don't think I could, I could jump over another hoop or go through another obstacle. I, I don't think I could do it. And halfway through this trial, maybe 10, 8 years into it, I just was so weary with everything that was going on. And I was at the end. And then I had a friend who called me and she, and she said, do you think that I could, she said, you know, Deborah, do you think I could come on over? I'll have something to give you. I said, absolutely. And so she came over and she gave me a plaque. And the plaque had that exact scripture that God gave me in the beginning of my trial. I have a God who sees And I have a God who hears. And I have a God who does not lie. (laughs) You have a God who sees you. And I don't care. The Bible says that he he, he gave gave, um, hope, I guess, or refreshed his inheritance when it was weary. I was weary, but he came by and he refreshed me. He reminded me again that I was his own. And I just want any one of you who feel like you're just at that point where, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I feel like, God, that maybe I'm going in the wrong direction and I need to maybe resubmit myself. I need God to start walking in my name. I need to start walking by, by the God who called me. 